monthly seminar. So I was going to say a weekly. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> anyway, so um, today we have with us Professor um, Stavros Fujikas. He's uh, in the Department of Bio and Ag Engineering, like myself. And then we've been fortunate to have him uh, on board. He, he joined us back in 2012, so this is his seventh year on, on campus, and it's been wonderful. Um, before that, he was a professor at uh, Aristotle University in Greece for several years, and before that, he was at uh, RPI in New York. So, um, Stavros actually is area, you'll as you find out, he does a lot of robotics and, and mechanization in agriculture, and uh, a lot of, actually, he does optimization and, and operations research. Um, so his background is actually in electrical engineering, and, uh, and now we'll focus on, on agriculture. And actually, Stavros, uh, back in 2016, he won the Junior Faculty Award for, for the College of Engineering. Um, so that, that, was, that was a great thing for him and the department. Anyway, so today we're going to talk about uh, robots in, in agriculture. And uh, am I blocking something? No. Okay, no. <laughs> and and uh, we're looking forward to uh, seeing, seeing the, all the great stuff that he's doing in his lab. So thank you. So, well, thank you, Fanny, and thank you, everybody, for coming to the seminar. Thank you for the invitation to present. It's always a pleasure to come back and present here. Uh, as Fanny said, I'm, I'm uh, leading the Biotomation Lab, and a major focus of the lab is the application of robotic technologies in agriculture. And we do have a strong focus on mechanization research. Uh, today I will be talking about harvest aid robots, some of the challenges and opportunities in this space. And uh, it's, it's a general audience uh, seminar, so there is not a lot of you know, detailed results, no equations, don't be worried, no problem. <laughs> no problem. We'll make it through. Uh, and if there are any questions at any point while I'm presenting, this is informal, we are a nice company here. Uh, you can just ask questions and I'll be happy to answer them during the presentation or afterwards. So, does anybody speak Spanish here? Can they translate what it says there? We need pickers. <laughs> pickers needed, right? <laughs> well, write down the number. <laughs> uh, why is that? I mean, there, there, there seems to be a need to put out a sign and say, we need people to pick, okay? So uh, don't we have machines to do that? And we were supposed to play it automatically, but it didn't that And so, you know, if, if you go in the Midwest, and if you take a look at some of the fields of corn and soy and, and wheat, you would see a lot of complicated, advanced machinery, high throughputs, a lot of mechanization. So we, we do have machines to pick, if you will, to harvest crops. But this is, these crops are different than the ones that I'm talking about in this presentation. This is a, a video, and I'm sure Dennis will recognize this, from a recent trip to Santa Maria. Do you recognize this crop? Cauliflower. Cauliflower, yes. Can a machine do this? Well, I wish I could build a robot to do this. It takes a lot of perception and sensing, advanced sensing, to find the right sized cauliflower. It takes a lot of dexterity to actually clean it, remove the outer leaves. And so, obviously, cauliflowers and then wheat are not the same. Uh, in terms of harvesting, they're not as easy or difficult to harvest. And that's one of the important reasons that we don't have robots harvesting a lot of our crops. Now, the bottom line is all fresh market crops are high harvest. For every fruit or you know, piece of vegetable that we consume fresh on our table, there was somebody who picked it for us. Okay. And this is why uh, we need a lot of labor because these crops, and we, we call them specialty crops, and we include fruits, vegetables, uh, nuts, and, and other crops, they cannot be handled by machines yet. 
Now, what are the possible solutions for us since we cannot harvest them now necessarily mechanically? Well, uh, we can increase the wages of the pickers so we get more pickers. And of course, that's something that is happening. So this graph shows the, uh, the wages of farm labor. This is up to 2010. Now it's even up to $15 per hour in California. And we also pay peace rate. But this shows you the number of farm workers hired uh, in the US. It's going down, although we pay more money. What about moving production abroad? Well, if we don't find enough people here, let's, let's go and grow crops in Mexico, for example. And we actually do that. But the problem is, or it's a blessing actually, that in Mexico, conditions are really very good. Uh, GDP is growing, the economy is going well. And this is the farm workforce going down over the decades in Mexico too. So we are competing for the same pool that is shrinking. There are fewer and fewer people uh, wanting to do farm work, even in Mexico and other countries. What about switching to mechanized crops? You know, if we can't really harvest strawberries mechanically, let's, let's switch to something else. And actually, we do that. These two graphs show you um, the almond acreage and the apple acreage. And apples are kind of steady and going down a little bit. Almonds are going up. The main reason being that we can harvest them mechanically. But of course, there is a, there is a limit to that. You can't really grow only when crops that are mechanically harvested and then outsource everything else and import it, for example. The other alternative is what we are pursuing is mechanize more the existing crops. Try to come up with ways to harvest them faster, more efficiently, better. So what about harvesting robots? We hear a lot in the news, uh, on media. Uh, yes, harvesting robots are being developed actively by research groups, by startup companies, especially for crops that are high value or high volume, so they justify all the investment. For example, strawberries, mm -hmm. apples, sweet peppers. Uh, this is a short video of an apple picking robot develop, being developed in California. It uses a vacuum to suck the apples from the tree. Uh, this is another apple picking robot developed uh, further north, close to Washington State. This is a sweet pepper picking robot that's been commercialized in the Netherlands. And this is a strawberry picking robot that's still a pre-commercial pre prototype. But all of these robots, everything that you see here, is not really a commercial product. They are all at a pre-commercial stage. You can't really buy them. Why? The major reasons are two. One is that their picking efficiency is low. So if you, if you deploy a machine to pick your fruits, you want it to pick 99, 98%, 95 maybe. You don't want it to pick only 70% of your fruits. Well, many of these robots pick a very small percentage, 50, 60, 70% of the fruit or vegetables. The other problem is the picking rate. They are not as fast. So for example, let me give you an example. If you have a human being, a picker on an orchard plant for picking apples, they can pick one apple in 1.5 seconds. Now, this company is investing in a lot of money, and, and, and Google is investing, and, and, and Cosla Ventures are investing in these robots. Their goal is to pick two apples per second. Okay? So it's not really to replace 10 people. It's to replace maybe two people. But the cost of the machine to do that would be about half a million dollars. So we are still at a stage where in order to match superhuman uh, or to, uh, to reach superhuman performance, we need to change paradigms in, in harvesting. We need to invest more in technology, new, uh, new ways of thinking. But this is a mid-term to long-term solution. And, and we are not going to see for many crops. For, for some, we might. But for most of them, we are not going to see robotic harvesting very, very soon. So what's the alternative? The alternative is called harvest aids. If we cannot replace people when they pick fruit, 
maybe we can make it easier and faster for them to pick. So we can develop technology, machinery, that will improve the efficiency and throughput of pickers, and also it will improve their safety and their ergonomics. And so that, that, that uh, uh, area of research is called harvest aids and robotic harvest aids, and this will be the main topic of, of today's presentation. And this technology is more of a short-term to mid-term solution because hopefully it seems that we, we can provide solutions now or in a few years, and then as we move further into the future, then robotics could take over uh, as, as, as the final destination if you will, for, for uh, mechanization. What kind of harvest aids do we have? There are two major types. One is for ground level crops. So this is an example of a harvest aid machine uh, for lettuce, but they are similar for strawberries, uh, cauliflower, broccoli, etc. What you see is that you see a large number of people picking manually, and then there is a large machine in front of them with a conveyor belt or maybe without a conveyor belt, where these people, as soon as they pick, they uh, uh, place their harvested crop on this platform, and usually there is a number of people who are doing packing. So they take that lettuce or, or cauliflower, they inspect it, if it's okay, they put it in a plastic bag, wrap it, and then it moves on to the, to the rest of the logistic chain. So that's one type. The other type of harvest aids is for tree fruit. And these are called orchard platforms. This is an example of an orchard platform. This is a big machine. People are standing on it. They are picking fruits from trees while they stand on the machine. And the machine is doing also some of the bean logistics. So it's, it carries the bean, and then the pickers deposit the fruits in the bean. Uh, and, and that way, they save time from climbing ladders and moving them around, and also it makes them it makes it safer for them to pick. So these are the two major types of harvest aids, and we will now um, discuss briefly what are some of the challenges with these machines and opportunities, and what we are doing in the department and in the lab to innovate for these two different types of, um, of uh, harvest aid systems. So, two types of harvest aids, what I claim is that progress has been really slow on the front of harvest aid technology. And to prove my point, I have two pictures here. These are two orchard platforms developed in two different times, decades. And I would challenge you to tell me what are the decades when these two were developed and were operational. If you can tell from from the design, I mean, they, they look pretty similar, but could you roughly tell, you know, is this 1990, 2000, 1950, or why is that, what, what's the decade? Any, anybody want to try? Take a wild guess, no, you Danish, you don't qualify, you've seen <laughs> 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 holding back, I think. So, let me ask a question. Yes. Are those pictures originally color, or they were originally black and white? <laughs> One of them was color. color. The other was not. <laughs> so I played a small trick there. <laughs> so, so the picture on the left, and from the back, it's hard to see, but I don't see any kind of fall protection or harnesses. The mm -hmm. picture on the right, I see what appear to be harnesses. Mm -hmm. So I would presume the picture on the left came earlier. Uh, my guess would be probably from the 60s. Okay, this is an engineer's answer. I like it. <laughs> I have had a different answer some other time. They looked at the fashion, the clothes they wore. <laughs> and they said, no, this is really old. <laughs> this is newer. So actually, yes, you are very correct. This is 1968. This is 2008. See, this is 40 years of difference. The, some of the technology, but it's not really the, 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 the core technology that has to do with the, the machine itself. It's more uh, some of the safety issues and, and, and some other 
um, design issues, but the, the core idea, the core technology is still pretty much the same. And this is another example, it, it's not really, it's a little bit washed out, but this is a harvester, a, a harvest aid machine for lettuce, and this is the new, and this is the old picture. Again, they are about 50 years apart, and actually the grower who took those pictures this is from his father, and he took this picture, and he had the people stand in the same way so, <laughs> so they can show the difference. And there is little difference, actually. Wow. So progress has been slow, and <clears throat> what are some of the reasons? And when I say progress, I mean, have these machines made it much faster for people to pick? Are they much more efficient or cheaper? Um, to you know, to gain more uh, penetration in the market and uh, adoption, <clears throat> and they haven't that much. So one characteristic is that all of those machines are typically very large, and they serve a large number of pickers. They may serve anywhere from four, six, twelve pickers, and sometimes even more. Why? Why do you think would be the reason for that? Why aren't they smaller? Yes. Because they want to pick in one pass. That's correct. So they want to pick in one pass. They want high throughput. So they cover, let's say, eight rows. And these machines are also not very cheap. They're not, you know, five, ten, fifteen thousand dollars. They run up to forty, fifty, eighty thousand dollars. So you need to serve many pickers with that machine. You're aiming for that high efficiency, but there are some challenges, some issues related to such large machines. One is that the efficiency gains are not really always large. Sometimes they're small and sometimes they're negative. I was very surprised uh, a couple of years ago there was a grower in, uh, in uh, Salinas. They were using a strawberry harvest aid of this type. And actually, they were picking slower with that machine rather than when they were picking manually, which, which is counterintuitive. They pay a lot of money for the machine. Why would that be? What could be reasons why these machines are not as efficient? Any, any ideas? Imagine having a really large machine, right? As long as it's moving on a straight line, everything is fine. If it needs to turn now, that becomes a problem because they need to stop working, they need to maneuver the machine and move on to the next set of, let's say, eight rows. Well, what we measured was that it takes about 10 to 15 minutes to, to do this. To stop working, turn around, place the machine again properly, that's wasted time. Another more subtle issue, or it's not really that subtle, is that if you have eight or 10 or 12 people working together, some of them are slower than others, some are faster, right? Also, the amount of crop that's ready to be harvested in front of them varies, it's not the same. That means that the machine often is slowed down by the slow pickers. In a way, the slower people become the bottleneck of the machine. It cannot move faster than the slowest people working on it. So efficiency gains are not really guaranteed, and sometimes you live and lose. Another issue is deployment and transportation. If you have a large machine, of course it's difficult to transport it from field to field, and also, as I mentioned, deploying it in small fields is also challenging. You need large, large fields and long fields. Scalability also is low. So if, for example, you, know, you need a, a, a machine that serves four pickers or two pickers or six or 10, you can't really adjust that machine to different crew sizes. You either buy the big one or a small one, but that's it, and there are no small. Well, nowadays there are some small ones, but most of them are really big. So, these are some of the challenges, and the other challenges that work, the worker ergonomics are questionable. 
what that means is, you know, imagine this machine, this large conveyor belt on wheels moving in front of the pickers. The pickers are picking, and as soon as they grab their cauliflower, they basically don't move much. They just deposit it on that machine and keep picking, which means that for a large percentage of time, of their, of their working time, they are in a very bad stoop position. They are not really flexing, they are not changing posture. So although their efficiency becomes higher, uh, the, uh, the working conditions are not always better. Also, those machines sometimes are pretty noisy, they are loud, and the pickers don't like that. And it makes them feel like they're working in a factory rather than outside in the field where they might hear music on or talk to each other, uh, etc. So these are some of the challenges of these machines. And as an opportunity, what I, uh, what I like to call is that there is a lot of technology out there now, sensors, electronics, computing. Are there ways to try to overcome some of these challenges by introducing robotic technologies in these, in these machines, in these harvesting machines? And so what I will cover next is two examples that we are working on in order to introduce such technologies. So we'll, we'll first talk about strawberry harvesting a little bit. Uh, how many of you have seen pickers picking strawberries in commercial fields? And I will raise my hand. OK, so a lot of people have, have witnessed that. Uh, <coughs> actually, well, yeah. Strawberries are basically uh, grown, cultivated on raised beds. And when harvest time comes, people, pickers, they use a small carito, a small cart. It's in front of them. They place a tray and then some clamshells inside it. And they pick strawberries in this position. They put the strawberries in the clamshells. And when the tray fills up, they carry it all the way to the edge of the field to a collection station to be uh, inspected, and then they will get credit for it so that they get paid. Now, this is definitely an expensive process because 35, 40% at least of the production cost is these people, these pickers. It's labor intensive, it's back breaking work, it's, it's not pleasant. And a lot of time, anywhere from 10 to 30% is spent just walking back and forth in these long ferrules. That's wasted time, in a sense, because it's not picking time, it's not productive. And we also have sleeping accidents because there is mud, there is uh, uh, strawberries there, uh, so we can have accidents. And so this is not, this is not a, a, an easy job. This video shows, this is a video showing pickers. Now they, these trays are full, so they are rushing out to the uh, inspection station in order to deliver the full trays and get empty trays so that they can resume picking. They are not supposed to run really because it's, it's not as safe, so they're supposed to walk, but you know, they're motivated by the piece rate, and in many cases, they, they do run. And then you see they rush back into uh, the position where they stopped, and they resume picking. Now, as I said, a lot of time is spent walking. And the question is, well, if we cannot build robots to automate this part of the process, is it possible to do something about this part of the process and essentially reduce or eliminate, although elimination is not what we want, but make away with a lot of this because that's non productive. And of course, this is not a new idea. As I said, there are harvest aids with the, uh, uh, the goal to do exactly that. But I already presented some of the issues related to large harvest aid machines efficiency issues mainly because it's, uh, it's slowed down by slow pickers and also uh, ergonomics issues. So we would like to do something different, something which is in a way orthogonally different than the existing paradigm. 
And so what is different is what we call frail bots, or fragile crop harvesting mobile robots. This is a project that was still is founded by uh, NIFA USDA. The main idea here is to eliminate large machines, large harvesting machines, and introduce smaller robots. And these robots, the only thing they do is they transport food trays from the picker to the collection station and bring empty trays to the picker when they are done picking. So it's like a courier service. And all the only thing it's doing is moving back and forth these strawberry trays, either full or empty. And by doing so, their goal is to reduce this non-productive working time of the pickers, but also to attend to harvesting ergonomics, as I will explain later. And by reducing the working time, also reduce uh, sleeping accidents. Now, what, what you will see here is three different versions of these robots. They, they started from being really small, and now they're a little bit bigger, but still the idea is to have something that, that you can uh, put in a truck or more than one of them and then deploy them in fields and move them around relatively easily and that they would be low cost. And the key idea is you have 15, 20 people, a crew picking strawberries, and you may have five of these robots or three or two or six, and we will see how the number affects the, uh, the operation. Okay, so this is not a personal harvest aid. I'm not one person having one robot. These robots are, are shared by the people. Uh, this is a short video. Oops, no. I was again supposed to start with my So that was the envisioned uh, mode of operation of the smaller machines. They would fit inside a single ferrule, and they would go back and forth. Uh, and of course, change ferrules when they need to serve different pickers. Uh, the current version that we have, because we had, in, in certain fields, we had stability issues with such a small footprint. Uh, we now move to a version that straddles the bed, so it occupies two of those ferrules. But the key concept is the same, not much changes in terms of the idea or the, uh, the frame. So if these robots act as a courier service, the question is how do they know when to go to a picker? If, if you call for Uber, you call for them. There's an application to do that. If you want a pizza, well, again, it's either you call. In the old days, you called. Now you go online and you order it. So how can a picker, if the picker all of a sudden is done picking, how can he call for a robot without actually doing something special? We don't want to engage the picker in this process. It needs to be transparent. And, and for, for the picker, it should be uh, a, a very easy to use this system or be served by this system. Well, there's no way you can program the robot to you know, respond to hand waving or whistling or, or speech, and you know, the robot might be a few hundred feet away. But what we can do is you know, we can think that all of the pickers, all of them, every single one has a little cart that they are using to pick strawberries. And so that cart could become the interface between the man and the machine. And so this is what we actually did. So here is your picker, and this is the carito, the, the small cart that they use. Well, we, we purchased some of those, those carts. These are commercial. They are cheap. They're like $25, $30. And we built and installed some electronics package and some sensors that in real time monitor the weight of the strawberries that you are picking. So this trace here shows you an empty tray, and then the pickers pick strawberries. The weight goes up, goes up, goes up, goes up. The tray has a capacity of about 10 pounds. So when the capacity is reached, what happens? When this is when the picker needs the robot, when the capacity, when the weight reaches about 10 pounds. So what we did is once we built these carritos and you know, all the electronics, 
then we included I don't want to update my <laughs> No, I don't want to. So we build a wireless system that conveys this information, the data, to the robot fleet, to the team. So now, this graph here, the weight, is known by the robots. And when I say by the robot, it is known by a computer that's running some software. And that computer, when it reads that you are at five pounds, and you, you gather those five pounds, let's say, in two minutes, it can do some projection and estimate that you will need the robot in two minutes from now. So it's doing some prediction. And then it is sending the signal to the computer, and the signal dispatches, schedules, basically, the robot and sends its robot to the best picker. And by saying the best, I mean the picker that will overall minimize the waiting time of the of the group. So there is an algorithm running in the background that's doing the scheduling and, and allocating robots to people based on a criterion that minimizes the overall waiting time for the people. Now, uh, to test the efficiency of this system, we build a harvesting simulator. This is just a simple animation but what you see here, these, these uh, uh, symbols are the pickers picking, and then these dots are the robots going back and forth from the collection station to the individual pickers. And we collected data from time studies in, in strawberry fields, so this simulator actually replicates the process in terms of the time it takes to fill a tray, uh, all of the pattern, the motion pattern, and everything. So it's really accurate, and we we, are, uh, we have tested that. And then based on this simulation, we can now test scenarios where we have multiple robots, uh, more, fewer, or less for, uh, for a certain uh, number of pickers. And what we came up with is that if you, if you look at those curves, we have a crew of 15 pickers, and then we said, what happens if you have three robots, uh, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, etc. So as you increase the number of robots that serve the pickers, this perpendicular, the vertical axis, is the efficiency. So without any robots, the efficiency is about, in this case, 85%, which means the average person spends 15% of their time walking. And then if you deploy this fleet of robots, you can reach up to 99.5%, which is pretty much 100% efficiency. In plain English, if you deploy those robots, a picker doesn't need to walk at all. They can spend the entire day picking strawberries. I'm not saying this is good for them, but this is what you can achieve with these robots. This is something you cannot achieve with a large harvest aid machine because the robots are a different animal. This is a service, a courier service that is shared among people. And so there is a lot of dynamic load balancing of the work. If somebody is faster and somebody is slower, the slow guy does not slow down the entire crew. They are decoupled from the rest. So this is a great benefit of introducing robots in such a process. Now, of course, 100% efficiency is not good. It means that that person doesn't walk at all, doesn't change posture. So definitely, this is not something we would like to do. But the interesting thing is that the robots give you the capability to reach this number. However, if you program them properly, then they can let the pickers walk because we are monitoring the weight of the, of the carito, so we know how long a picker has been picking for, how many minutes or hours, hopefully not hours consecutively. So you can embed into the programming of the, of the robots criteria that relate to ergonomics. For example, if we know that a person should take a break every 20 minutes, or they should walk every 15 minutes, 
then you can program the machines when they receive a request for to serve a picker, either not to go, so that carito that we have developed has a green or a red light. If the right, if the light is red, it means no robot will come. You need to walk. If the light is green, it means somebody is coming to serve you, to transport your tray, or it could come to you, but stop at a distance of 50 feet, so that way it, it forces you to move and go to the robot and go back. So. What the robots introduce here is flexibility. You can program them to do different things. Also, you need to be fair. That means that if you have 15 pickers, the waiting time of the pickers should be pretty much the same. You cannot have Stavros' waiting time be 10 seconds and then Fari's waiting time be one minute on average because Fari will be totally pissed. And, and pickers, <laughs> know, pickers know that. And so what we have done so far is we developed all this infrastructure, the software, and we are planning to do some field experiments with the pickers and the robots this summer to, to verify these, you know, these type of curves, but also get more feedback on you know, what it means to be fair and, and, and what kind of interventions would be more acceptable and, 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 and good for the pickers themselves. Uh, and then I'm switching from strawberries to something bigger and, and, and higher. This is fruits, tree fruits. So this is the standard way to harvest fruits. You have a ladder. This is not, well, Victor, sorry, this is not a good ladder. I know that. <laughs> <laughs> this is an old fashioned ladder. Maybe this is from the 70s again or 80s, I don't know. Uh, and you move that ladder and you have a bag that's initially empty, and then as you pick, it becomes very heavy. You go back and forth, up and down, move it. It's really very labor intensive, risky, inefficient. What can be done about it? Well, as I said, robotics is a solution, but unfortunately, we are not there yet. So the other approach is harvest aids. And I don't, I, I'm not, I don't want to show the entire video here, I just want to show you what a harvest aid platform looks like. You have a big machine where the people stand on the two sides of the machine at two different lay, uh, levels, for example, and they pick from those levels. They fill up their bags and then they empty them in the bin. And so that way they don't need to go up and down, they don't need to walk, they, they don't waste any time on these, on these activities. But there is a problem with these machines, at least one problem, is that they implement what we call what we call zone harvesting. So each person is at a different level, okay, and they are picking from that height. Now what is the problem with that? What is the problem with zone harvesting? Can you think of any potential issues that restrict the, the speed and efficiency of the system. Say I'm picking only yellow and the other person is picking only blue. Just slow harvesters with the slow dynamic group again. So yeah, thank you. Yeah. This person might be slower than the other person. But also even if they have the same innate speed, maybe there is more fruit here than here. And actually we have done studies where we digitized trees and, and, and digitized the locations of the fruits and we do know that the distributions are totally non-uniform. So again, the slower person and the, you know, the, the more crop load becomes a bottleneck. There is an imbalance in the load of the machine. Okay. So what can we do? Well, this is another project along the same lines, harvesting technology. Uh, that includes robotic technologies. The goal is to maximize the harvesting throughput. And the main idea is the following. Imagine that previous machine, the same machine, but now there is a camera in front of it that can find the distribution of fruits on the trees. So with the camera, we know there is more fruit here, less here, less here, etc. So we know the, the supply for labor what it is. We also come up with a way to measure the picking speeds of the individual pickers. So if we had those two pieces of information, 
how much fruit there is and where, and how fast the people pick, it should be possible if we can actuate these platforms these, with lifts, it should be possible to assign slower pickers to less fruit and faster pickers to more fruit, and in a way do a load balancing of the crew. And we do know from theory that if you load balance machines or units that perform some work, this is when you get uh, your maximum through. So this is the idea to load balance. Uh, this is a collaboration with uh, Carnegie Mellon University. They developed some uh, special camera that works uh, under uh, intense light conditions, but also dark. So we have our way to find where the apples are. It doesn't really rely on color only or at all. Uh, and it has very good efficiency, very good results. And we also build uh, an electronics package to actually fit it to existing picking bags and measure how much fruit goes in per unit of time. So we have way, our way to know how many fruits there are and how fast the pickers pick. Now, since we have that, we also purchased a, a, an orchard platform. This is a commercial platform. This is the camera system in front of it. It's moving in this direction when it harvests. And then we implemented this approach. So we, we retrofitted this platform with hydraulics so that we can lift pickers, uh, uh, each picker individually. And there is a computer that takes the information from the camera and then takes the information from the picking bags integrates it and controls the elevation of the pickers in real time. And this is, oops, sorry. This is a video from uh, Apple Orchard Experiments in 2018. So you can, th this is, this is a, 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 an Apple Orchard with uh, V-trellised trees. So they're kind of diagonally placed and they're like a fruit wall. So they're designed to be harvested by such machines. This is the camera, the stereo camera that finds the fruits. And you can see here that this is the, the front hydraulic lift that moves the pickers up and down depending on how fast they pick and how much fruit there is in front of them. Okay. And it's running a special algorithm that tries to maximize the overall efficiency of the two people, the front the one, the person in the front and the person in the back. There was a lot of development work done for this platform. Dennis is, is the mastermind here, but Victor was also extremely helpful with a lot of safety uh, interventions and we still need to do some extra work this spring. <laughs> uh, this is an ongoing project and we'll be doing more experiments this summer. Uh, what what we have predicted that it can be done is that if this is the platform speed and this is the percent of fruits that you can pick, it turns out that if you are using a, a platform that does two zone harvesting, if you want to pick all of your fruits, you should really move slower than about one centimeter per cent. Because if you move too fast, there is no time to pick all the fruits. You're missing fruits. However, if you use the approach that we developed, you do this intensive control, you can keep picking almost 100% of the fruits at a speed that is at least 30 to 40% higher, which means you can increase performance, picking efficiency by about 30%. It's not guaranteed. It could be 0% or 5, but it can be as high as 30. It really depends on the imbalance between the pickers if one is very slow and the other is very fast, or if there is a lot of fruit on, on the upper layer and less, much less on the lower, then, then the efficiency gain is very large. If everything is the same, uniform crop load and the same picking speed, then this would be zero. You would be getting the same efficiency. Also, what the pickers told us, although this is not a formal study, is that because of this going up and down, they don't really need to bend in order to pick fruits that are low, and they don't really need to stretch as much to pick fruits that are high. 
which is something that they enjoyed very much. They really like the way this system works. So now we'll do more field experiments this summer to, uh, uh, to get some more information from the pickers, but also now we are controlling the speed of the platform, not only the elevation of the lifts, or we will be controlling it really soon. Rain is working on that. And uh, we hope to have some very interesting results. So perhaps I'll, I'll come back next year or, or sometime uh, and then report on those. Uh, so summary and conclusions. Farm labor shortages are here to stay. We are not getting more people, regardless of if, or if we build a wall or not. Uh, people will not come because, more people will not come because uh, they are just not there to come. And robotic harvesting machinery offers me to long-term solutions, but we, for most of the crops, it's not applicable now. So, robotic harvest aids is an alternative that can provide some solution or help um, in the near term. And what they can do is they can increase efficiency significantly in certain cases. And they offer the possibility they can and they must be programmed in a way that guarantees worker safety and improved ergonomics. So this is something that's not only hardware now, it's also software. And this is actually a, a, a challenge and a new uh, uh, area for research because uh, programming can change the way these machines work and how they interact with people. And by that, I would like to thank everybody who made this research possible from the lab, the California growers who are tolerating us in their fields when they harvest, and also like to acknowledge all the uh, financial support that we are getting, that without it, this wouldn't be possible. Thank you for your patience, and I would be happy to take any questions and hopefully give meaningful answers. <laughs> interested in the stability of the, um, of the cardiotis. And in terms of, uh, pre do, do, must the field be prepared between the um, rows, the raised beds, to keep that stable? Um, mm -hmm. I mean, what does it do if you have bad weather too? Yeah, so good question. First of all, the, the term carito is reserved for this little car, not the robots. Okay. And so these, these are stable, they use them all the time, but they're pretty simple, light, they have three points of contact with the ground, pretty stable. The robots, it turned out that they were not stable for, for quite a few situations where you had tractors going into the field and there were large uh, uh, changes in, in height, even inside the ferro. Uh, there is also uh, leaks from the irrigation system, a lot of mud. So that is why we, we uh, decided to go from, oops, from the smaller machines to the larger one. The larger one is, is not huge, it's, it's pretty small actually, uh, but it straddles the bed and so it's extremely stable. There's no way for it to be. So I don't know if that answers the question. We cannot really groom those ferros. These are real world conditions. There is rain, there is food traffic, there is machine traffic, they spray a lot. Um, so it's you need something that's a little bit bigger. Otherwise, they would have to spend a lot of time, effort, money in order to groom the ferros. So it beats the purpose to do that. Okay. Yes. Yes, please. Just drones. <laughs> is Amazon using drones? <laughs> yeah, it, it's not really practical to to do that uh, because for many reasons. One is the payload here is ten pounds. I'm sorry. Oh, so the payload is is large, ten pounds, uh, and the. We are talking quadrocopters or no, not really fixed wing drones, right? And, and those can fly for about, the small ones, for about 20 minutes without a payload. If you want a large payload and large mission time, 
they must be much larger. What happens if they fall? <laughs> there are some pretty large drones out there, but if something happens, and usually it happens, then you have people underneath and, and, and drones falling. Also, the cost would be much, much higher to deploy such a solution and the complexity. So we didn't really think or even you know, uh, dare to think that we would do this with flying machines. We went for the ground. Yes? Um, so I, I'm glad to hear about your plans this summer to be talking to some of the harvesters because it seems to me that one of the greatest challenges is probably going to be the workers themselves. Um, and the fact that they are paid by piece rate means they absolutely want to constantly be harvesting. So even their perceived slowdown, you know, waiting for the robot, and I'm just curious how mm -hmm. that is actually going to, um, yeah. that what, is, what their perceptions will be and whether they will like the idea. That, that, that's, an, that's an excellent, not question, it's, it's yeah. uh, uh, a realization. Right. Because if they even feel that they are being slowed down, although they will not, I mean, if it runs properly, they might reject it. Or if they feel that the person next to them is waiting less than they are waiting. Well, and I, I'm sort of imagining, you know, these are, this is how a lot of these workers are earning their money for much of the year, right? Mm -hmm. They're during this very short season. Well, it's not that short. Not that short. <laughs> yes, no, I, I agree. Um, but, you know, I can already imagine, like, well, maybe I'll turn my shirt up and start, like, sort of saving some strawberries for when it comes to me. Or, um, you know, some of those shortcuts that for them will be a real monetary difference. Yes, yes, um, yes. So, for, uh, just a, an extra point on this. Our Carito has a button where you can use to manually call a robot. For some reason, mm -hmm. maybe the system fails and you want to call. Mm -hmm. And so it's possible that the pickers will start pushing that button even much earlier than they need to. Right. Because they want zero waiting time, yeah. right? So how do you beat that? I mean, humans are smart yeah. and they will find ways to outsmart the system. Uh, and that's something we want to just investigate because now it goes into humans and human psychology and, and machines and software. And this is really something new. I'm not aware of, of people doing that. There are robots that are being deployed in uh, assembly lines, but it's a different setting. It's not, it's not this setting. Uh, so these are some very interesting questions that we are also looking forward to getting some answers for. Yes. So just a question about your testing for this summer. Will there be some workers who will be doing the standard sort of picking versus those that use the robots? Yes, we would need to come up with an experimental design where you have your, your the workers that are working on the same block, for example, and are not using the robots. And then you would have, for example, you would select five pickers, and then for those five pickers, you would deploy one robot, and then you would deploy two robots to try to see that ratio of picker to robot, and then what, how that translates to efficiency. But the design would be such that you would be able to compare against your, your you know, baseline, what is manual. Because that changes also from morning to uh, afternoon. It will change based on the crew, based on the, uh, on the plot itself. So it's, it's not easy, it's gonna be challenging to get some statistically significant results. I mean, we know that. It'd but be interesting if you could switch them, the, those who are doing the standard the, robot, yeah, the and have them switch uh, and see. Right, so be, because then you keep one parameter the same, yeah. so the, yeah. these people yeah. work on their own or with the machines. Yeah. I was just curious about the apple picking. The, mm -hmm. the cameras sound really wonderful, um, but does the system, I mean, so you identify where these apples are, mm -hmm. and that changes the speed, but what happens if the workers miss apples? Do, is there any way? No. Do you, okay. There is no feedback mechanism. Okay. They, they don't miss apples, and actually, if a worker misses an apple, there is no way the camera will find it. The workers, the people's perception system is so acute, and these guys are working day in and day out, so you and me would find maybe 80% of the food, they would find 99.
But if they miss it, there is no way for us to know that they did. And it's not really also that important. What is important is to provide some basic load balancing. Uh, if they miss it, they would have missed it anyway. Yes, Can I just ask more specifically about the cameras? Are they 2D cameras or 3D infrared cameras? And okay, yeah. How, so are they identify the shape or how are they? Okay, so these are, uh, this is a, a, a pair of monocular cameras. So it's a stereo camera, yeah. but it's not off the shelf. So it's two monocular cameras. You get the two images and you do the stereo. Yeah. So then the, uh, the way they calculate, they find, they detect, well, the, the fruits, originally they were using the specular reflections on the surface and doing some more standard image processing. Now they switched, like everybody else, to deep learning, machine learning. So they have thousands of examples of apples. They uh, label them individually, and then they feed them into a neural network that is trained to recognize them. And it turns out that this is much, much better and more accurate than the previous method. So that, that's how they do it. And pretty much everybody in, the, in this area is, has moved to machine learning. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you. 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 Thank you.